welcome everyone to the uh, session by Todd Little about turbocharging your Scrum. We are glad that Todd could uh, come uh, and join us today. Uh, great to be here with the Agile India. It's been a long time uh, appreciating the work done by the team in, in uh, India to keep the Agile India movement going. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about turbocharging your Scrum uh, with Kanban. I'm Todd Little. I'm Chairman of Kanban University, and uh, I've been around the Agile space really since before it was Agile, and been involved in, in a number of uh, and seeing how it's evolved. And uh, what I've seen now is that uh, Scrum has been become quite dominant, but there's I think um, this element of Kanban that can be utilized um, to help Scrum, and I think there's a lot of misconceptions about, about uh, what Kanban is. So when we talk about Scrum. I'm talking really about the standard uh, Scrum framework, and I think uh, everyone's quite familiar with with the Scrum framework. Uh, in, in particular, I think the uh, the Scrum guys calls out the the uh, three five three, the three roles, the three events, and three artifacts. And to a large extent, that's that's what people are ending up doing uh, in their Scrum implementations. Um, and so that's what we're going to start with. Um, you know, we're looking at if we look at how I see in the in the world um, the scenarios of what have come out of Scrum transformations. Um, there's a there's a group of people that where Scrum has worked for us, um, and we continue to get better. Um, there's another group where Scrum has helped a bit, um, but we haven't really gotten uh, better lately. Stall out. Um, for other people, Scrum has been a complete disaster, or you know, been called out as a disaster. And in some cases, it it really didn't help, but it really didn't hurt either. Um, the challenge is that that many people have been implemented Scrum, it's quite dominant, but they're not getting the results they want. Um, Jeff Sutherland's on record as saying 58% of Scrum implementations are late over budget with unhappy customers. It's a real challenge. We're not getting out of Scrum what we really hope for. Um, and it's not entirely Scrum's fault. I mean, Scrum can do a lot of things. Um, and the uh, I think the thing that, that we see, though, is that when people are stalling, there are things we can do to help. Um, and part of this issue comes back to the core foundation why we see transformations fail in the first place. The problem with transformation is the whole concept of transformation is based on a, on a mindset of we're going to do a, tradi a traditional change process. We're going to go from a current state to a future process, to a future state. And in the process, we're going to do a transformation. Um, and this is sort of the, the fundamental challenge that we have in bigger bang transformations. And that is that this only works when the future process is designed uh, in advance, or if there's good. And so if you're making this big change, you have to, uh, you're making a big leap of faith that, that the steps that you're making are going to make you improve. Um, and the challenge with these types of transformations is effectively they're reverting back to a big design up front. And we know that we're in the Agile world really trying to avoid uh, big design up front. So um, what do we do? Why is this happening? Well, if we look at a transformation and we on the, on the uh, Y axis, we're looking at the capability of the organization uh, and uh, X axis being time, um, what we've sort of have hoped for is that we start with the current state and we're going to take this time to do a transformation and get ourselves to the future state. And we're hoping that this gives us a, a nice path that eventually we uh, improve nicely. Uh, and the reality is what happens in, in real transformations, we see it over and over again. And this is really uh, pointed out well by um, Virginia Satir, who, who saw this type of behavior happening in working with um, uh, addict families that the addict families, the alcoholics or drug addict families, um, when they, they had reached this point of stability of how they had operated together, but when they introduced a change in the environment to try to fix the problem, to fix the, the, the perpetuating problem, things actually got worse for a period of time. And then over time, if they could, if they could get themselves out of the deep valley, eventually things would get better. And so this is called, you know, commonly referred to as the, uh, as the satire change model. Um, and we've noticed that this type of behavior happens almost any type of change. Um, uh, and uh, we see it in transformations. And 
the, the, the reason for this is that we, we are making a change to something that has reached the sort of status quo um, and steady state, and that actually makes things worse for a period of time. Um, the challenge with this is that that change, if that transformation is too big, um, that, that valley can be very deep. So there's an element of safety. And the other element is that if it's too big, the time is too long and we lose patience. Um, we say, oh, we didn't, we didn't see results um, soon enough. And so we need to, uh, and many times what happens under a lower maturity situation is that organizations will panic under stress and they'll abandon uh, um, uh, their, their hope of getting better. Um, and these types of problems are very, very real. And uh, if we look at some results from, from uh, uh, the PMI, the Project, Project Management Institute, um, we see that very few transformations are actually that successful. Only 18% are really outright successful. 68% uh, have some degree of moderate effectiveness and 18% have, have outright failure. And this is the challenge we have with, with the bigger bank transformations. What we try to do, what we look at do in, in, um, in the Kanban world is avoid two problems, one of overreaching and the other of false summit plateau, because these are problems that we see regularly. These trying to take on too much and hitting a point where you get to a new happy place and that new happy place prevents you from getting better. The Kanban method works towards, towards these and looking back at the this change curve, what it means is that rather than going um, with the, the overreaching here is taking on too big of a change. So we looked at not take on that such a big change. The other half of is the false summit plateau. We come out of that uh, in a mode where we're happier than we were before. And the pain was so great that we say now that we got to a new happy point, we're going to stop improving. We're, we're going to give up uh, any real chance of improving because we don't ever want to go through that big change again. The Kanban method approaches this differently uh, because we're missing that benefit. We want to use evolutionary change, not revolutionary change. And that's the whole element of the Kanban method is to, to make our changes small enough and continuous enough that we get continuous improvement. So looking back at our, our problem is rather than um, going on this, this uh, line, the Kanban method approaches it from a very different approach Let's not worry about designing things up front. Let's take smaller increments, make those, those J curves or um, the, the, the valleys uh, much smaller and continuously update based on new information. And that's evolutionary change in action. And that's really what the Kanban method is about. And this is what we can bring uh, to Scrum. Kanban can help your Scrum uh, by utilizing a lot of what we've learned in the Kanban world that's quite complementary to the Scrum approach. What many people think Kanban is, is just a bunch of stickies on the wall. And that's not true at all. Um, Kanban method is far richer than that. I think the other thing that people can often think of is they think in terms of Kanban versus Scrum, which is again, not true. Um, the Kanban method is not a framework. Scrum is a framework. The Kanban method is not just a board. It's not something you install. It's not even a transformation. Um, and any real comparison of Scrum versus Kanban really makes no sense because they're not the same. They're not the same in any sense. Um, Scrum is a framework. It's an incomplete methodology. It's a, it's a guidance of, of structure that you put in place and then you can build on top of that. Um, Kanban starts with what you do now. Uh, it's a ma management method for improving delivery of knowledge work using evolutionary change. We start with what you do now. Whatever you do now is perfectly fine. We start improving it based on that. Uh, and while it's not a transformation, Kanban can be quite transformational. And I'll give some examples of that uh, later on as to, as to how um, uh, we've been able to make some, some significant improvements in, in uh, uh, various areas. So rather than being a framework, I look at Kanban as a fun framework. It's something that is there that um, it, it's not something that you can compare to Scrum or, or many other agile approaches. It's something that we do to improve your existing process and continuously improve your existing process. So we'll start with what you do now if you're using Scrum. 
that's great. We're going to use Scrum as your starting point. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing in it, whether we have to throw out your Scrum and come in with Kanban. That whole concept is just, it's just flawed. What we do is we start with what you do now in your Scrum and we start working on how we can improve it. The thing with Kanban is because it's a start with where you are, it's the great unifier. You can start anywhere. You could be waterfall, you could be in safe. Um, you could be in chaos. You could have no predefined method uh, that you're working with. Um, and still, Kanban can help you by starting with what you do now and improving it. You can be Scrum, you can be CMMI, any of those are all fine. And you can be any of those within an organization can have multiple of those going on at the same time. And Kanban can be there as a unifier uh, that pulls that together and uses it as an improvement technique. Kanban is not first reorganizing into pods, squads, chapters, blocks, herds, mob, packs, or mobs, right? We don't do reorganization. Reorganization is a last resort. Um, and we don't come in with all these fancy, you know, you know, like a consultant company coming in and say, oh, first thing you got to do is follow this pattern. No, you don't, we don't reorganize. We don't give everyone new job titles. Uh, we don't take those big hits uh, in the transformation model. What we do is we take, we, we first focus on what you do now, and then we start looking at where's the pain and then what can we do about it? So it's really more structured by introspection, looking at what you're already doing and then improving it. So with that, let me just quickly introduce some of the key concepts of Kanban and how they really apply within a Scrum world. So first of all, we'll talk to the um, Kanban change management principles. So the change management principles are quite basic. Number one, we start with what you do now. And this requires us to really dig in and understand your current processes as they're actually practiced. Not how you have documented them, but as they're actually practiced. You want to really fully understand what's the status quo, what is work, how are you working. And then we can get better about it. We also expect we respect existing roles, responsibilities, and job titles. Uh, we don't give everyone new job titles. We don't uh, tell them you know, reorganize into new teams or anything like that. We start with what you do now, and reorganization becomes a gain agreement to pursue improvement through evolutionary change. And in order for that to happen, we need to encourage acts of leadership at all levels. So everyone comes, takes on acts of leadership, steps up and work towards the improvement of the, of, the, uh, of the system. So if we look at Scrum and Kanban, different perspectives, let's introduce two characters here. We have Sal, short for Salvador, and he's a longtime Scrum practitioner. And then we have Rosie, and she's gonna talk about how she Kanbans. Yes, we Kanban. So in this, the first uh, change management principle, we start with what you do now. Now in the Scrum world, this is, this is one of the things that's a little different because typically what you're doing in a reorganization, uh, in your transformation is reorganizing into cross-functional teams with the three roles of product owner, Scrum master, and team member. And that's fine. If, if that has, is what you have done from a Kanban perspective, that's okay. Um, but Kanban does not explicitly require cross-functional teams. If you already have built cross-functional teams, that's fine. That would be your new starting point. In Kanban, a reorganization is generally a last resort. So if you're in Scrum and you've done this and you've done the reorganization, you've built your cross-functional teams and that part's working, then we continue with it. Now, of course, we may actually we go along, if, you know, continue to explore uh, and improve, and there may be future changes to that. But if that's a working model for you, we don't really want to break that up for that in the Kanban world. If we look at two, uh, agree to evolutionary change, this is an area where, where um, there is quite a bit of overlap with Scrum. Um, and that Scrum is based on empiricism, which done well continues to evolve. Um, what unfortunately I see frequently is that many implementations stall out or revert. Uh, I've come into organizations many times and looked at, at you know, talk to them and, and uh, frequently they say, well, we, we were, we were struggling with, with what we're doing. And so we reverted to exactly what we were taught. Um, if you're doing Scrum the way you were taught, um, you likely aren't doing Scrum very well. The whole point is to continuously inspect and adapt and continuously improve. And um, unfortunately, I think that's one of the big problems that, that um, 
uh, I see in Scrum implementations is that that is not done well, that continuous improvement is not done well. And I think in the Kanban method, because it's core to our DNA to continuously improve and, and we have structures and models for how to do that, um, the approach we take is start with what you do now, almost implicitly requires that you get continuously better um, because we're making these small changes. So you've got to fully understand the current process in order to improve it. I think that's one of the challenges that people have in the Scrum world is that they're given a framework and said, okay, go use this, go install this framework, and by the way, improve it. But they don't necessarily fully understand how the framework works. They don't have the fully inner workings of the framework to understand what knobs and, and, and uh, uh, knobs and dials they have to work with to improve. Whereas in the Kanban world, part of the, the approach to it is to really spend the time necessary to understand your current process so that you can continuously improve it. We then use guided experiments that can be measured to establish this mindset of continuous improvement. So it's getting that change uh, mindset in place in order to, to get um, uh, continuous improvement. So change management principle number three is encourage active leadership at all levels. And this again in the Scrum world, self-organization can be a really key element to encourage active leadership. Um, but what I see a lot of times is that the, um, the product owner or the scrum master or the team manager will be viewed as leaders uh, and the team members simply become followers. So this is something that we, um, we want to call out is that we want everybody to be stepping up um, as, as a leader uh, and, take, and not necessarily stepping up as a leader, but at least taking acts of leadership. The acts of leadership are, are step, stepping forward with ideas for improvements. So we work to create a safe environment to encourage active leadership at, at all levels. All right. So those are the three change management principles. Um, moving on from that, we have the six general practices of the Kanban method. And these six general practices are to visualize your work, limit work in progress, manage your flow, make your policies explicit, establishing feedback loops, and improving collaboratively, evolving experimentally. I'll go through each of these, looking at this from a, a Scrum and a uh, Kanban perspective. So with Visualize, um, we see that many Scrum teams make a visual board either physically or using electronic tool. This is a very, very common um, uh, aspect of the Scrum, Scrum approach. And I think it's, it's a, a good start to, to start with having at least a visual board. Um, even in, in, in the, either a physical board, which we love, uh, or electronic uh, uh, versions of that, which are, are good as well and, and really help with, uh, uh, when you're distributed. Um, so the, the way we look at it from the Kanban, if you're not already done so, you can look at your workflow and map out your workflow as a series of knowledge discovery steps. Um, by building this out, this helps give you a little bit more detailed uh, understanding of the state of um, where you're at in the, in the knowledge discovery and gives you a better sense of how things are flowing. Look at the entire service delivery, not just at the team level. Many times there's multiple teams involved uh, in putting together service delivery. So the visualization that you want to include is is to go broader, to, to, the, the more you can see that exposes where, where, the, where things are impacting flow, that's a great thing. So we're looking to visualize in order to, to see flow. The other thing about visualization, in addition to just the board, is other things such as your policies. We're going to get to that. Visualizing your policies and visualizing some of your metrics. The metrics can tell you a great story. They can tell you a story of, of how your flow is working. So visualizing the board, visualizing the policies, uh, visualizing the metrics, everything that we can visualize, it just gives us a better insight into what we're doing. And as you can see, a large number of Scrum teams are already using uh, Kanban. Most likely, this 81%, most likely their view of using Kanban is they're using a Kanban board because that's what it's called in many of the you know, JIRA or ADO. Um, 
But so the idea of utilizing Kanban in Scrum, very clear. It's it's uh, uh, people are already do, doing it, and they work well together. They work well together. Kanban can really help with Scrum. So limiting work in progress. How does that look uh, from a Scrum perspective? So Scrum limits work to look at work in progress to some extent, really by creating small batches. So by by limiting yourself to small batches, uh, what you can fit within the sprint. Um, that's some degree of, of limiting work in progress. Now it doesn't all, I think the, the, the extra step we take in the Kanban world really is to set whip, whip limits for each step in the work, each step in the process. This gives us improved control and improved predictability. So while we get some degree of, of whip limiting um, through, through the small batches, I think um, the extent to which we can control that better, reduce, um, the, you know, keep the focus and reducing the work, work in progress across each of the individual steps gives us a much better uh, control over our flow, much better predictability, and gives us a much better continuous flow. So managing flow, and this is the key. We, the, the key to the Kanban method is that we want to be managing flow. We want to be focused on managing flow more than we focus on managing the workers. We want the, the flow of work to happen. We want to focus on flow efficiency, speaking with the workflow, not so much on worker efficiency, making sure people are busy. Um, getting people busy is not good, to, is not useful to the extent that it sometimes actually creates um, barriers to flow. So let's look at that from a Scrum perspective. Um, again, uh, with managing flow, um, the challenge is that while we have self-organization, many times the implementations are not. Um, you know, if your daily scrum is sounding like a status report, then you've probably got some room for improvements. I saw this very, very early on in the early scrum days, particularly when the three questions were very popular, um, that the, the responses from those three questions almost invariably came down to a status report rather than what we really intended to be, which is how are we planning our work for the day? What are we looking at that's, that's in our way so we can make continuous progress? So, but I think it's just typical that, that, that when um, people don't fully understand Scrum and are, are practicing it just in name, um, it reverts to a status report. And if that's what it's looking like, there's room for improvement. Um, when we look at also some of the metrics um, we have in, in the Scrum, a common metric, although not called out explicitly in the Scrum guide, is velocity um, from, from your uh, uh, story points. Uh, Velocity can be useful or it can be misused. I've seen, I've, I've actually seen it probably misused as uh, often or more often than, than I find it to be uh, useful. In the Scrum, in the Kanban world, we really focus on the work and let the workers self-organize. We walk the board asking what is preventing items from flowing. So we focus on the work items. What is the work item? What's the work item telling us? Not what is the worker telling us? We don't need to know that somebody spent, you know, yesterday fixing their build environment because that's what that means is that they're justifying their time. We're not worried about justifying their time. We're really working about well, looking at well, what's keeping us from this item from flowing. What do we need to do going forward? So more of a future look going forward. What do we need to do to keep this moving? We collect and display metrics such as lead time, run chart, and cumulative flow diagrams. And as we learn more about how those metrics work, it just tells us a great story about what are our opportunities for improvements. Making policies explicit. Um, this is something many Scrum teams do. They've made a few policies explicit like definition of done or definition of ready. And these can be great policies. Absolutely, these are, these are things that, that make, make a lot of sense and are really, really helpful to understand how the team's working. Um, in the Canada world, we look even broader than that. We start looking at other policies which could be made explicit, such as um, pull criteria. What are our classes of service? Classes of service are essentially identifying a form of prioritization, if you call it that. We tend to stay away from the word prioritization, but it's basically indicating a service level that we're going to apply to different um, different work items. And then associated with that, what are the what sort of service level agreements do we have? So coming up with different policies and and we don't want a lot of policies, but we want just policies that really help the team understand how are they working together? What can they rely on uh, other team members? 
So next one, um, feedback and feedback loops. Um, this is a big, big key to me because I think they, many people think about uh, feedback loops and they talk about the and, and they, they conflate feedback with feedback loops. And there's a big difference between feedback and feedback loops. Uh, they're related, but a big difference. And, and what that is, is that if we look at this picture here, this is the cover of uh, David Anderson's blue book, Bam Bam, great book, actually absolutely recommended as a that's a great uh, starting point for you if you're wanting to learn more about Kanban. We look at this and there's a lot of information coming back. The information coming back is feedback. The reports back from the individuals is feedback. The board itself is providing us some feedback. Maybe we've got some reports and metrics that's providing us some feedback. The key thing with a feedback loop is this last one. Let's do something about it. Doing something about it closes the loop. If we don't do something about it, we have an open loop. We have feedback, but it's open loop. It's not being closed. Nothing's happening. So feedback loops is about taking the information, the feedback, and then taking the active leadership that closes the loop. So in the Scrum world, um, Scrum has the five events for the feedback. Um, and unfortunately, while many religiously do the ceremonies, many fail to do something about it. Now, this is something that high-performing Scrum teams absolutely have this figured out. They figured out that feedback loops are the key to making this all work. So you have to do something about it. Um, the Scrum Guide states that improvements uh, may even be added to the sprint backlog for the next sprint. So there's, an, there's a, it's, it's clearly in the, the Scrum Guide, Scrum DNA, this is challenges many people struggle to figure out how to do it. Um, in the Kanban world, we have cadences, um, which if you're starting with Scrum events, the cadences can be, the, the idea of the cadences is you start with what you do now. So you start with your uh, events that you already have, and then, then we work from there. Um, and, um, but the key is to utilizing the feedback and taking the act of leadership to do something about it. And that ends up closing the feedback loop. So let's look at the, the, the cadences and the um, events and how they relate to one another. Uh, we have the five scrum events, the sprint, the sprint planning, the daily scrum, the sprint review, and the um, sprint retrospective. There's almost a one-to-one -one correlation between the Canadian cadences and the sprints uh, and, the, and the scrum events, but there are some nuances that are different. Um, for example, the sprint itself, um, Sprints are not a required element in Kanban. You don't have to have them. And in fact, many people don't. Uh, but if you like sprints, it's okay to keep them. Kanban does not say you don't have sprints. It just says you, you, they're optional. If you want them, you have them. Uh, and if you're starting with Scrum, you probably will start with them. Um, but um, uh, many, many people as they evolve will end up breaking out of the sprints um, if, they, if they feel that they're no longer necessary. Sprint planning. There's a very somewhat analogous element called the replenishment meeting. And this is where we uh, pull new uh, work items into the system. Uh, the main difference usually is that the replenishment meeting itself, as we call it out, does not involve planning. Uh, but if you were to start with Scrum, your, your version of replenishment meeting would probably be your sprint planning and you would continue to do the planning until you decide that there may be better ways to do that. Um, so that would be up to you. Uh, there's the daily scrum, and in the Kanban world, we have the Kanban meeting. Um, I think probably our main shift here is to, to really focus on flow, um, which I think many people have already done in their scrum uh, daily, in their daily scrums, has shifted to, to the approach we take in the Kanban way of, of looking at walking the board or working on looking at how items are flowing. Uh, the sprint review, we have a service delivery review. I think the key element of our service delivery review is that we really try to, to review the metrics and focus on what the metrics are telling us and how does that impact some of the decisions that we are making. And then lastly, the, the sprint retrospective. Um, this can be kept or dropped. Uh, many Campbell and Campbell implementations so will start with the retrospective if they were doing one. And um, they will, they frequently they'll end up dropping the formality of a retrospective and handle improvement more continuously through the review. So that it's not that they're not doing it, it's just they're not doing it as a formal event. Um, and the challenge I see with frequently with retrospectives that are done as formal events 
is that there, there's a lot of emphasis on the ceremony of the, of the retrospective and on the doing of the retrospective. Um, unfortunately, there's not too much of the closing the loop. There's not the active leadership often that are necessary to actually take action on that. Sounds like this, I held a retrospective and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. Did you actually do something about it? And if not, uh, why are you holding these retrospectives? Let's do something else that actually looks, works better. So lastly, the improved collaboratively evolve experimentally. Um, Scrum aims to be based on empiricism and continually evolve. If you're doing what you're taught, you probably aren't doing Scrum. Um, we look at experiments. Experiments might be a bit of a misnomer um, as we uh, have lots of pragmatic guidance now for many years of Kanban. Uh, Kanban maturity model is a great guide, but might be appropriate uh, in some of your next steps. So speaking of the Kanban maturity model, let me introduce that briefly. This is something that's come out in the last few years. David Anderson and Theodora Bozova have, been, have worked on putting together this model and have written uh, a book, which now has a second edition, um, and really is, is there to document um, how we have mapped out over 150 specific Kanban practices to observable business outcomes and mapped out over seven levels of organizational maturity. And this is really looking at three key elements, culture, practices, and how it leads to outcomes, and then what you do to manage that evolution. So how, given that we're talking about making these small steps, how have we seen organizations make these steps? And it really depends on where they're at now as to what the next appropriate next step is. So we map these out from the level zero, the oblivious, we call it, this is the my way. This is where a lot of people are working individually. Everyone's busy, but what are they producing? Um, their individualism, unpredictable, unreliable service, overburdened people, which means unhappy customers, unhappy managers, unhappy people in general. So this is where we start frequently. Then we move into more team focused, never the, quite the same way twice. We see that every team reports to deliver on commitments, but I know customers are waiting longer than six months for delivery. It means the teams are thinking they're doing great, but when it actually comes to pulling that together, multiple teams involved in it, nobody's looking at how it pulls together, how it's in the end workflow, how does it all come together? So at customer level ML2, we have customer driven, uh, never quite the same result twice, but they're better, better service or better meeting customer needs. And this comes together through managerial heroics. Um, so delays and last minute tension despite coordinated team effort. So they're getting better, pulling together better at focusing on customer needs, um, but the integration of the teams is happening through heroics as opposed to being really structured from the, from the get. At level three, we're fit for purpose. We're heading towards predictable delivery. We're no longer having heroes. Uh, the processes are under control. We have an understanding of the system, of the end-to-end -end system when we're pulling together. So this, this is really starting to scale. How are we scaling it out to actually get uh, good delivery? At level four, we're risk hedge. Everyone's happy, no more surprises. Not only do we have a well-defined system, but we're at the point where we can act actually anticipate changes in, in demand. So we've got some quantitative measurements that are helping us really understand how are things coming so that when something comes in, it's not a surprise. So basically, at this level, we're really uh, moving on beyond uh, and, and highly predictable and highly predictable even in uncertain times. So we look at this, look at this as a bit of a metaphor um, with bicycles and, and it's not all metaphors are, are, uh, are flawed, but some are useful. Um, and if we're level zero, we start on the tricycle. We're starting with what we're doing now. Uh, we move up, we get maybe move some training wheels. As we get to training wheels, we think we're on a bike, but actually we keep falling off the bike. So we roll back and we pull back forward again. Uh, now we're starting to get really good at the bike. So we got a bigger bike and a faster bike. Maybe have some gearing on that bike. We're really doing well. We think we're really agile on our bike. Um, but as we mature and we get more fit for purpose and really, really start to look at where are we going to be utilizing the bike, we may have a specialization of the bike. So the, the, if you think of the individual as the organization and the bicycle is sort of the evol evolution of the process. That's what we're looking at here as we're getting better and better and improving on our, uh, our, as we're going. And this is all evolving maturity. So let's go through quickly a case study. Um, this is a positive science, um, a case study where they were starting with Scrum. Uh, this was doing some uh, brain plasticity work. It was um, a very, very high uh, research type activity by a uh, 
front neuroscientist, Dr. Uh, Michael Marinovich. It's not brain surgery, it's not rocket science, um, but it is brain science. So um, as a background, they had started with Scrum as their development process. It was working fine. It really helped them initially get the first product out the door. They thought it was really good. They really liked Scrum. They didn't, they didn't really want to uh, move away from it. They thought it really helped. But they started to have some problems. Um, using, they just didn't feel like um, it was that Scrum was holding, that it was allowing them to operate um, the way the business was operating. Um, and they have some agile coaches from outside and they, they, they just weren't doing Scrum properly. That was the problem. There was no problem with Scrum. They just weren't doing Scrum properly. And then maybe there was something to that. But that, that isn't what they felt like. The team didn't feel that that was the case. They felt that there was something else. So what they did is they looked at where their sources of dissatisfaction, what's their motivation for change. Stories were not getting finished. Deadlines were being missed. These were the, the customer perspective. And internally, there's a lot of fragmentation. They're pulled in many directions. Priority, priorities changing. They were doing these task-based estimates, which they felt were just um, useless, inaccurate, too much effort to produce, and really weren't helping them uh, in any way. So their initial campaign implementation was very simple. They didn't want to break things. They didn't want to. They, they really were sort of happy with Scrum, but they liked this idea that maybe they should take some baby steps here. So instead, what they did is they they did two two steps really in their implementation, initial initial implementation. One is they um, stopped task estimation and did their uh, user story estimation by t-shirt sizing. So they, they sort of got out of the quantitative uh, estimation. And then uh, the other thing they did is they implemented a per person whip limit. Uh, so very, very simple starting points. Um, they started with their initial scrum board. They, they just made a, a little bit of uh, variation of that. Um, so that was their scrum board, uh, their campaign board, and then they set up uh, three whip, uh, three items per person whip limit, and they encouraged collaboration on items as well. So just very very basic starting points, and that, that was uh, that helped them a bit. Um, it really provided some relief from the overburdening. They just were felt like they were just trying to tackle too much, and this gave them some structure around that. Uh, it also gave them a rich language for expressing their frustrations. Um, it engaged them motiva in, motivationally uh, for the next level of change. So then they did this again. They looked at what are some of the sources of frustration. Uh, the customers were still feeling like they were, you know, the, they were too busy to discuss new work. The stories weren't being finished. The deadlines were being missed. Many of the same things, but the, the team started to get a little bit more um, detail and understanding what really happened in those six, six months is they started to really understand their workflow. Where were their challenges? So it exposed them to having that conversation that they could have, the rich conversation, the meaningful conversation, the feedback that then they could say, let's do something about it. Let's take some action. So what did they do? They created some goals of their new system. What did they want to make happen? Reducing the conflict, uh, context switching, using work in progress, steadier workflow, really focusing on flow, getting clear priorities. Um, so after they made some more changes. This is their incremental update. They, they went, they, they dropped the concept of iterations and went to a flow uh, and service level agreement. Um, instead of sprint planning, they they did a replenishment meeting and then they did the the, the planning just in time per feature. So they did, did um, uh, the planning rather than doing it all at once, they did it uh, on demand. Um, they changed some of the structures on how they did the demos and the retrospectives. Uh, the estimation, they, they dropped that, um, looking at it more, are we, are we able to fit this feature inside our service level agreement? Uh, they established a more detailed workflow and they had a per person uh, with them. So they had a replenishment meeting and they created this thing called a top 10 list. It was very simple. So just, th this was a structure where then, rather than trying to reprioritize the backlog, they said, let's just tell me what the next top 10 are. And once you have top 10, we'll just pull from that top 10. So you basically, you're committing as the product owner that these are the top 10 items and we can pull them. Uh, the, the colors here are indicating the service level, uh, the service, the class of service, and you know the higher level, like the, 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 the pink ones are the expedites. And so they get pulled faster, but others, the, the, the team had agreements and pull criteria on how they would pull items in uh, into their board. So this is you know structure of the board. They had a backlog. They pull items into the top 10 list. Once it's pulled in, then they start pulling uh, the features in and breaking the stories down. 
um, and, and pulling that through. So this is just a, a very natural extension of, of how they had been working in Scrum, but it was a richer, a richer model that really helped them improve and understand what they were doing. Um, so here we have the board that they actually used. Um, they had a whip limb, they, they, they described, they understood where were their pain points and what are, the, what are the actions we can take against those pain points. So putting a whip limit on the product owner, to hold them accountable, and they put the board next to the, the executives so that when that board got pulled up and it, and it was stopping things, uh, everyone would get on top of the product owner and make sure that the, the items in the accept column uh, were, were uh, passed through. So they had the deployment bottleneck they wanted to protect. Uh, and they wanted to create smooth flow through the clinical testing. These were all, that was a special, a, a shared service, clinical testing was shared service. And so they wanted to make sure that that was uh, managed appropriately. And then they had an expedite the lane. This is one more case study, and that is the um, Kanban at Vanguard. And this is a, a case study that was presented by David Hughes um, at the Kanban Global Summit 2019. And this is a case where they had been very much using utilizing Scrum, um, and they had some, they had again had some sources of frustration. They weren't really feeling like they were improving uh, in their Scrum. They had had reached what David called Scrum stall. They had gotten some improvements, but then they just weren't getting any better. Um, they had average delivery times ranging from 38 to 57 days um, for their work items. So what they started to do was implement um, Kanban, and you can see over time. Here, with one year of Scrum, things had been um, operating in that that uh, range of what was 38 to 57 days. And once they started implementing Kanban and, and, and collecting the data, they really could really focus on that and get their average lead times down substantially, as you can see from the blue line as it drops. And the other thing was they had no real um, outliers. They were able to manage their workflow so they had no outliers and they could bring their average um, work item lead time. So it's 90, 78% improvement in approximately 90 days. So that was with one, one team. Um, this was team two. We really, they, they really went to understanding and building out. They really focused on visualization as a key element and, and visualizing out the complete workflow. So that was great. They had a big board that they worked with. Um, and again, they ended up coming up with about a 77% improvement uh, within 90 days. So with Scrum, we have at this point in this team, we actually have a little bit more data on collecting uh, on how they've been doing with Scrum. And as they work with Kanban, they drastically improved and only very few outliers. So they really were able to get to improve their predictability substantially as well as improve their, um, their lead time. And not only did they improve the lead time, but you can also see from the cumulative flow diagram, the slope of the, of the cumulative flow diagram, that up until here, really sort of when they were in Scrum world, they were operating probably where we would call a KMM level one to two, uh, at a team level, or maybe a higher level, the customer focus level. Um, they were able to really drive through the improvement process to KMM level three, uh, which gave them about a four, four X improvement uh, in, in throughput. So remember that again, this is from a team that was starting from Scrum. So, you know, we were getting a 4X improvement and four, one fourth lead time uh, on top of Scrum. And this was done through big visible uh, physical Kanban board, upstream filtering, keeping things from getting, entering the system that really didn't belong, uh, a focus on bottlenecks, really making sure that the flow is working and then leveraging the Kanban maturity model uh, to make this happen. We see this frequently. We see this other places as well. This is an example from Kanban uh, of Kanban Impact at Accenture in Brazil. And you can see the slope of the continuum flow diagram before they did the class. This is really just the, the, the KMP class, Kanban uh, System Design class, which is called KMP1. Uh, the, the very, very uh, slow uh, throughput. After the class, they went up substantially. I think this is almost a 20, 20 times improvement in, in the slope of the, uh, uh, of the delivery uh, by the time they had implemented the Kanban. So these are the types of things that Kanban can do frequently just by, by lowering whip limits, counterintuitive idea that I, if I work on less, I can get a lot more done, a lot more done faster. Um, it's counterintuitive, but it works from time after time. Uh, so just some background for you. Um, 
There's the official guide to the Kanban method. I highly recommend that. That's available free on, on the Kanban University website. Uh, the case studies that I mentioned, both the uh, positive science and the Vanguard case study are available also on the resources page. Uh, David Anderson's Blue Book, highly recommend. That's a good place to start. There's also a essential Kanban condensed, which is a uh, freely downloadable book that goes through the Kanban method. Um, and we also have the state of Kanban survey that uh, gives some good insights into how, how things are happening in the world of, of Kanban. Um, so with that, I think uh, right more or less on time. And I'm happy, I think uh, probably we'll end up having to take questions in another room or I don't know how, how we go from here. Uh, so, so Todd, there are, there are four questions here. Uh, we can probably take them and then we will jump to the hangout. Okay. Okay. Uh, the first question is from uh, Pradeep. Uh, uh, during the daily scrum, if someone reports as there is a problem, uh, the resolution is the top priority for the scrum master. Do you think this is not as per scrum guide or if the scrum master has to act on it immediately, then it would be termed as the team is using Kanban also? So I, I, yeah. yeah, so I think this is probably the difference between when they, there is a sense that the the scrum master is it has been this long term that the scrum master is the person who's responsible for for fixing bottlenecks or for fixing um, blockers. Um, and actually, I'm not up on the scrum guide to say whether that's currently the how the scrum guide calls it out. I certainly know that's how it used to be called out is that the scrum master was that role. Um, I think in the Kanban world, we view this as really um, the team is responsible for organizing that. There's not there's not this one person who's responsible for for um, process. There's this person called the service delivery manager, and the service delivery manager is there to reduce friction. So, and I think really that's what I, I see the, the role. When I see good, really good scrum masters, their role is reducing friction, and it doesn't necessarily mean they have to take it on themselves. But I think what they what we would say is that they're enabling it to happen. They're figuring out what can I do as the scrum master or the, the facilitator of this team to um, help these blockers or help these bottlenecks um, improve. So there's, there's not one absolute answer to this. And I think that's what happens frequently um, when people um, start from scrub, they're looking for, well, who can I put accountable for this? And the reality is we really, we're really trying to say it's contextual. It depends on how things happen. And what I've seen in high performing teams is the entire team steps up uh, to figure that out. Okay, thanks Todd for uh, verifying that. Uh, yeah. The next question is from Guy3. Uh, which metric in Kanban can help the team to inspect and adapt? Um, I think there's several. I usually, we, we usually, usually recommend Three, three key metrics as a start point because there's lots of metrics that you can have, but there's three that are sort of that, that can tell a lot with um, and they're easy. They're easy to collect. So the, the three we recommend are the the, um, um, the lead time distribution, the lead time histogram, uh, the run chart, which is also an indication of lead time, but it's showing how lead time is changing over time, uh, and that gives an indication of trending. So the lead time histogram just gives us an indication of how variable. Uh, we are. It, it helps us with understanding predictability and understanding what sort of service level we should be expecting based on history. So it gives us, you know, we essentially frequently will replace estimation with data collection and the data collection helps us understand well, what's realistic to expect uh, for these items. Um, and then the, the third um, one we look at is cumulative flow diagram. The cumulative flow diagram is very help, helpful in telling us how is work flowing and is, it, is the system stable? Um, which is great. Um, is it getting worse, which we don't really like, or are we actually getting better? And getting better is interesting because getting better is actually not stable, but getting better is what we want. So there, there's times where we say, well, this, these things only work in a stable environment, but if we're getting better, that's actually better than being stable. So we don't really care about stability if we're getting better, we want to keep getting better. Um, but um, yeah, those three metrics are the ones we recommend to start with. There's other metrics that can be very helpful. Uh, flow efficiency can sometimes be helpful, mostly to just indicate do you have a problem with flow efficiency? Do you have an issue where you're having a lot of delays? But often that will come out um, from the lead time chart as well. Um, and we're really looking at the lead time distribution is how, are you having a lot of delays? Are, you, are there um, a lot of challenges? 
So um, all of those metrics, I think, are great um, uh, to, to help. And then there's more. A lot of the inspect and adapt is just really fully, deeply understanding um, what does your what does your process look like? What's your context of your process? And uh, then you can really start making understand what knobs you have to turn. Thanks, Todd. Uh, this is slightly longer question from Abai. Uh, generally, it is recommended that we choose Kanban methodology only if there is a specific reason to do so, since it requires really high discipline and following Kanban principles. If the teams are not able to follow Scrum properly, probably they will not reap, reap the benefits even if they switch to Kanban. Thoughts? I, I think that's... I would say that's probably not. I mean, I, I understand where people are thinking, well, Kanban requires a lot of discipline. I think the reality is it, it, it is the key with Kanban is that, um, and this is, I think, where the Kanban maturity model really helps, is that what you don't want to do is if you're really in a level zero, level one type of maturity, you're not, you're not really getting, you're really struggling. Um, what you want to do is you want to take small baby steps. And I think what you don't, what you certainly don't want to do is try to jump to level three. And so the challenge is as we teach Kanban, we teach Kanban to the level where you could apply level three um, principles, practice, practice and principles, but we also teach how to do it incrementally. So usually the things that we look at, if you're struggling uh, with Scrum, there are Kanban elements that you can bring on. Visualization certainly easy to add on. Um, but I think one of the ones I would I would uh, bring on early is is whip limits, um, and oftentimes that's one that has the most resistance internally, uh, either from um, the, the development or you know from the from the delivery team that is opposed to it, or from you know the customer side, the business side who says no no I need to keep pushing things through. But if you can shift yourself and get yourself to where you start with whip, whip limits it opens up the world of possibilities. And we just see it repeatedly, uh, introducing whip limits will, dra will drastically improve your overall flow and predictability. And it gets you out of this overburdening mess that is creating incredible inefficiencies. Um, so I think that, that what, you, what my, my advice is, it's not about, and of course the, 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 the wording of the question itself indicates the the mindset problems because he's called it the Kanban methodology. It's not a Kanban methodology. It's a Kanban method that we apply on top of an existing method. So it's not, you're, you're not going to, uh, it's, again, it's not a scrum versus Kanban. It's applying Kanban practices and principles at very, very small incremental pieces on top of what you're already doing now. Already doing scrum, great. Struggling with things because you're not delivering, you're not having predictability. Let's start looking at whip limits. Let's start looking at what else we could do. Let's start looking at additional policies. Let's start looking at mapping the workflow better so that we can understand where we're having delays and we have better predictability about where we might have delays in the future. So there's lots of tools that we have in the Kanban method that can be, be slowly added on to your Scrum. And even if your Scrum is not working well now, we can, we can do things to drastically improve it. Thanks again, Dr. Uh, uh, this is Question from Gerard. Uh, I think he's he was one of the speakers uh, today. Uh, how can we yeah. make uh, a physical Kanban board work for remote or hybrid remote teams? Yeah, that's a great question. And there's there are some tools coming out in the world that are are working better at that. Um, something that I would say is that some of the better Kanban tools um, like Kanbanize or Swift from Digitate uh, do make a very good um, comparable. Um, virtual board to a physical board um, and have built it from the design. They've designed it as a Kanban tool. So one of the things as a Kanban tool, since Kanban is in a continuous change mode, you know, we're continuously improving. Our boards are continuously improving, which makes virtual you know, tools have struggled with that because they like to think, keep things constant. Um, but tools that are designed as Kanban tools understand that as a core and build that type of flexibility into it. Um, there's other tools coming out. There's a tool from uh, iObeya uh, that is creating Obeya, virtual Obeya rooms. So Obeya, room, Obeya rooms come from the Kanban method in the lean world, uh, which is a big, big room for big, big visual room. Everything uh, that you have that will help you understand the, the, uh, the running of the operation, all the metrics, all the, data, all the collection of data, all the, all the flow is, is in that one room. There's a tool called iobea that does that virtually. 
um, and does a quite nice job with that. And I think they're an uh, uh, interesting partner that we're working with. Excellent. Um, I mean, uh, it, it was a privilege having you here, Todd. Uh, Thank you. Really appreciate it.